Amen. That'll make you want to dance, right? Hey, if you have your Bible, we're opening up to Matthew chapter 5. Hopefully you grab sermon notes on the way in. And uh, we're going to jump straight in with uh, today's element of the Beatitudes. Uh, Matthew chapter 5 verse 8 says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. And uh, that's what we're talking about today. Now, as you see that up on the screen, this is such an interesting thought that Jesus suggests. Um, because I, I would pose uh, that for his audience, it was a bit alarming. There was a, a, an aspect of that that would have been, had a little bit of shock value. Um, it, it wouldn't have been the front part, it would have been the back part. The front part is fairly innocuous. The, the front part says to be pure in heart, and that wouldn't have been alarming whatsoever. That uh, came from two Greek words uh, that you'll see on the screen, and it was kind of just a simple thought there. One being for pure was this Greek word that meant to uh, thin out uh, some kind of seed to eliminate chaff. Uh, you've heard about threshing and how a farmer would take kind of like a pitchfork, let's call it, and would thresh wheat up and the wind would blow the chaff away and eventually you end up with pure seed. And that's kind of the visual that was often connected to this word, uh, to be thinned out of all the obstruction or all the debris or all those kind of impurities. Uh, and then you see this other word, cardia, for, which would have represented heart, but not like, you know, the organ, the, the thing that pumps blood, but more, uh, it was framed as the seat of life or the seat of the soul. Uh, this would have been where your emotions were, where your thoughts were, where your feelings were. Uh, we might use the phrase, I want, or I feel, or I think, all, all of that coming from uh, this same Greek word of, of heart. And so Jesus says, uh, blessed are the ones who have that thinking, feeling, uh, desire, that, that there's purity in that. So, so none of that is really alarming. But that second part, for they will see God. Um, that's the part that uh, would have been difficult. Um, I imagine Jesus' audience would have been crystal clear on some things about that concept um, that no one, no one saw God literally and lived. Um, they had kind of one of their iconic leaders, Moses, that had been centuries before, but his story and his influences and impact had carried on all through the generations. And uh, the scripture would say this in Exodus 33, verse 20, that you cannot see my face for no one may see me and live. This was something that Moses was saying, God, I want to see you. Would you show me your glory? And uh, God gives him this arrangement. I'll hide you in the cleft and I'll walk by and you'll see the backside. But you, if you were to behold my unrestricted, unfiltered glory, uh, you couldn't handle it. And so uh, no one can see my unrestricted, unfiltered glory and live. Now, the prophets would later write and speak about uh, snapshots, foreshadowing of the presence of God. And uh, so, in part, the people had, had seen God in shadows of his attributes. They knew about who he was from what the prophets would talk about. Uh, they would, at times, see aspects of his purpose play out, and he would speak to certain prophets who would also communicate that to all the people and there were glimpses, glimpses of eternity, but nothing unfiltered. So when Jesus says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Uh, the audience would have been sitting there and would have, uh, he, he's talking metaphorically, right? He's got to be talking metaphorically. Did you, you heard that, right? He said, we'll see God. Um, yeah, it's got to be, it, it's got to be suggesting, you know, some kind of metaphor. Or is it? And there would have been an element to this that would have been really challenging for the people. Uh, Philip, later, in John chapter 13, Jesus would tell the disciples he would be washing their feet. And he would say that the Son of Man is going to be handed over and he's going to give his life. And I'll no longer be with you. 
And uh, Peter's going to object to that and say, no, no, if, if everybody abandons you, I won't. And Jesus has dialogue with Peter, and Peter, you know, goes away. And then uh, Jesus addresses the room of disciples, and he says, I go to prepare a place for you. This is John 14. Now he's going, I go to prepare a place for you, and uh, one day you'll be with me. And Philip comes to him, and he says this, as you see in your, in your verses, in your sheet. Uh, Lord, show us the Father, and that'll be enough for us. And Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip? Even after I've been among you such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. And Philip makes a request that most of us, most of us make in some form or another. We might word it different, but most of us have asked what Philip asked. Lord, would you show yourself? I mean, you're giving me this news that you're not going to be here or that something is changing. Lord, would you show me the Father? Would you show me yourself in this situation? You can be in a work situation, family situation, just a life situation. Lord, would you reveal yourself to me? Would you help me to see you right here? And this is a powerful concept for us. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Now, in Jesus' statement, there are two components that greatly interact with one another, and uh, we want to write this in our notes for Seeing God 101. Our purity must always begin with God's glory. Uh, When you have purity and glory, or His presence, or seeing God for who He is, our purity and God's glory, we have to say, which one is going to come first? Is it going to be my purity? If I get pure enough, if I get good enough, if I do enough of the right things, then I'll see God's glory. Or does God's glory come first? And uh, seeing God 101 is that our purity must always begin with God's glory. Uh, Most of us in here are familiar with uh, Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson and the stories that uh, are in writing or on TV and movies of Sherlock Holmes. Uh, anyway, there's the story that's in a, one of the written portions of Holmes and Watson. They're out camping at night, and um, they've had a bottle of wine, and they've eaten, and they're going to sleep. And uh, in the middle of the night, Holmes wakes up, and he nudges his faithful friend, the doctor, and he says, Watson, look up at the sky. Tell me what you see. And uh, Watson says, I see millions of stars. And Holmes says, what does that tell you? Watson, in his kind of intellectual way, says, astronomically, it tells me there are millions of galaxies and potentially billions of planets. Astrologically, I can see that Saturn is currently in Leo. Horologically, I can tell and deduce that the time is approximately a quarter past three. Theologically, uh, I can see that God is all-powerful and uh, that we're small and insignificant. Meteorologically, I suspect that we're going to have a beautiful day tomorrow. What do you see, Holmes? And Holmes sat there for a moment quiet, and he says, Watson, you idiot! Someone stole our tent! (laughs) You know, so often, people... Us can be looking at something and miss what's right in front of us. We can be looking at the wrong things in front of us. If you want to witness and experience God's presence and glory in your life, it's going to be connected to purity. But the tendency is for us to focus on the purity side. I'm not good enough. I didn't do enough. Rather than understanding the very thing that we should be looking at first and foremost in our life is his glory and his presence in our lives. If we want to witness and experience it, it has got to be established on him first. And I don't mean to offend anybody, but the reason that is is because inherently purity does not come with us. For instance, I'll put a couple of scriptures on the screen that we will say are true of your kids and maybe your spouse, possibly you. But it says in Jeremiah 17, the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? You know how people often will say, well, I'm just going to follow my heart. That's the craziest nonsense I've ever heard. 
The scripture says the heart can deceive you. Have you ever been deceived by your heart? You got it wrong. Your thoughts, your opinions, your feelings, you were off. And so the scripture says here, don't put your stock and your faith in that. James chapter 1 says this. This is a tough one for us. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. Anyone, pause. Anyone who says, you know, God's just tempting me right now. Negative. Negative. The scripture says the origin of that temptation, each one is tempted when by his own evil desire, he's dragged away and enticed. So if I pull back and I say, if that's true of us, I'm made in the image of God. I am not arguing against that. We are made in the image of God, completely holy. At the same time, we can be wrong and we can be astray. Then I better not connect me seeing him to my personal purity. I've got to first start with him and his glory. I want you to write something in your notes, a word that some of you are familiar with, some might not be, and that's okay. This is the word Shekinah. Say Shekinah. Shekinah. And I want to kind of just explain just a tad bit about it. Uh, This was a word that for long, long periods of time was connected to presence or dwelling. And it basically was a visible manifestation of God's divine presence. You'll see up there uh, two Hebrew words that would connect. They were from the same family, same root. Just like We've talked about this, how um, generous, generosity, um, can, that word can play in different forms, or gentle, gentility, gentleness, that can play in different forms. The same root word uh, produces mishkan, arshikan, uh, same root word, and it was this idea of to tabernacle. Or to dwell, to settle down, to sit with, to be amongst. And it's a very important concept that uh, God says that he will give his presence to dwell, to sit down, to be with, to be amongst. And uh, the invisible God becomes visible in part. The omnipotent God, the omniscient God, the omnipresent God becomes very localized. In Genesis chapter 3, uh, God walks with Adam in the cool of the day and sin in- interrupts that, uh, destroys it to an element. But then God is constantly making recompense for that. He's trying to reach people. And we have all the way over in Exodus where God gathers his people in this wilderness area, tells Moses, I want to be with my people just as it was originally designed. I want to be with my people. Bring them all up on the mountain. They say, no, Moses, you go. You be our representative. But God wants to tabernacle with them. He wants to be with them. And he gave them this cloud during the day. And at night, that cloud would take on the form of fire. And he led them. It was very visible that God's presence is with us. And he's leading us. It became understood this Shekinah glory. That God was dwelling with them and tabernacling with them. And he tells Moses, I want you to build for me. He uses that word, tabernacle. Build for me a place that my people can come and I will be with them. My desire is to dwell with my people. And it says in Exodus chapter 29, verse 45, then I will, and this is after the instructions of the tabernacle, he says, then I will dwell, that's that word shikan, among the Israelites and be their God, they will know that I am the Lord their God who brought them out of Egypt so that I might shikan, dwell among them. I am the Lord their God. You fast forward to chapter 40 after the completion of this tabernacle and it says, then the cloud covered the tent of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the mishkan, filled the tabernacle that he dwelt amongst them. Now this is fascinating to me. This week I was wrestling with this and thinking about it. You have a what and a where. You have an incredible what and you have an incredible localized where. You have the what of the glory of God, the presence of God, and you have where it is. And we often want in our lives the what and the where. I want the presence of God. I want the glory of God in my life. Where is it? Well, Scripture says in 1 Corinthians 3, 
don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit lives in you? So what's being pushed here is the writer is pushing into this concept, this truth that had been held, is that the Lord desires to dwell with his people. And not just from a mountain and not just from a cloud and not just where, you, you know, you come and visit, you know, on occasions if you're bringing the blood of some kind of animal, but that he's with you, that he goes with you. And so when we have the pure in heart shall see God, it's this invita invitation that imperfect people can experience the perfect God. The fallen people shall interact regularly with a risen Savior, that the pure in heart will see God and that he will dwell with them. Uh, seeing God 201, we'll write this in. How do we walk in that then? Uh, number two is that we anchor faith to the fact of Scripture more than personal feelings. This becomes really important for us, that uh, we anchor faith to fact, not feelings. Um, purity of heart. Being a genuine faith is virtually impossible to sustain when feelings supersede fact. Let me say that again. Purity of heart or a genuine faith is virtually impossible to sustain when feelings supersede fact. Now, I'll put a few things on the screen. This is uh, just very fundamental. But fact, what is fact? Fact is who is God? Uh, the Trinity, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and the truth of the Scripture. That's fact. When you take the Scriptures as fact, that they are the inspired Word of God, uh, that they are profitable for every aspect. You know, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 says that the Word of God is flawless. When I take the Word of God, the Scripture as fact of who God is, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, then I build my faith around that. The Holy Spirit helps me to pursue uh, living in response to those facts. Not because any of us want to be religious, not because it makes us a good person, not because it uh, elevates our classification in this life, but according to the facts, if the scripture is true, then the Holy Spirit allows me, enables me to pursue and live in response to what I read in the Scripture. And then feelings, my natural inclinations, my reactions, my emotions, good or bad, come after that. Now, as you see that on the screen, um, I'm not the first to take on those three words. There are far more famous preachers that have uh, took their hand at those three words. Uh, Jonathan Edwards did many years ago, uh, Elizabeth Elliot, Bill Bright of Campus Crusade for Christ, uh, Billy Graham. There's a long list of church pioneers that have taken on fact, faith, and feelings as their topic. Uh, in Dallas, there was a, a pastor uh, at the time that was well-renowned and well-respected named uh, W.A. Criswell, and he was teaching on fact, faith, and feelings, and he was paralleling it to marriage. And he was paralleling it to, in marriage, you know, feelings cannot come before fact. If everything's based on feelings, uh, you're, you're in trouble. He made this statement in one of his messages. Sometimes I loved my wife so much I could just eat her up. But then the next day I wish I had. <laughs> Sometimes feelings, if feelings are the leading factor, uh, you'll, you'll get into trouble. And uh, you'll see three words, those three words in different sequence in your notes and on the screen. One supports and one sabotages. And this is very simple. This is nothing profound, but it's very simple. Um, purity, genuine faith is supported when it's fact, faith, feelings. When I anchor and build my life around the facts of the scriptures, and I have faith response by the Holy Spirit to that, and then I allow feelings to come. And when I have hard feelings or problematic feelings, I'm frustrated. I'm discouraged. I, I will say I can get discouraged with the best of them. I can get frustrated with the best of them. If that ever is in front of my faith, it's going to sabotage my faith. I've got to make sure, and you've got to make sure, that facts are what our faith is hinged to and the feelings come after. Um, I've watched people, and you probably have as well, where feelings lead faith. 
And whenever the feelings are problematic or difficult, then they just all but lose this ability, so to say, to see God. The facts just become so fuzzy to them. Where's God? I don't even know if he hears me anymore. Start to entirely question all of the scripture. Try and rewrite it. Maybe that was for a different generation. Maybe that was true for a different people. Try and completely rewrite the scriptures. Why? Because feelings are tugging faith along. And we've got to pull back on that and understand that if I do that, if feelings are what drive my faith, then I'm going to be greatly hindered and fluctuate from time to time. I was on the phone last night with, uh, with a guy, and uh, he, he's in a dire situation. And uh, I was just trying to talk to him and talk to him about faith. But this is a guy, and I won't go into his details, but this is a guy that genuinely does love the Lord, and yet his feelings drive that faith far more than the facts of Scripture. And so he regularly finds himself, and I love him and try and embrace him, but he regularly finds himself in, where's God? Why did God do this to me? I don't know that there even is a God. And then something will change as feelings change, and suddenly, look at God. God is good all the time. All the time, God is good. Listen, we don't want to be people where those feelings are driving our faith. The scripture says in Proverbs chapter 14, there's a way that seems right to a man, but in the end it leads to death. Proverbs 28 verse 26 says, he who trusts in himself is a fool. Pause right there. Think about that. He who trusts in himself is a fool, but he who walks in wisdom is kept safe. And so if I want to see God in my life, I've got to anchor my faith to the facts before it ever gets connected to feelings. That brings me to seeing God 301. And that is resolve each day to move toward Jesus rather than what he offers. Resolve each day to move toward Jesus instead of what he offers. Now I want to show you a visual, something that I, I heard uh, I heard somebody talking about this. This was not something I came up with. I heard somebody preaching on it uh, sometime back, and then I just thought, what a great visual. And I, I put together a visual for it. So I'm going to put a, an image up here on the screen. Um, if you were to think about, in this image, you have two things outside of the man. You have light, and you have a shadow. And in this context, if we were to say the light represents God, Jesus, his word, and uh, you were to say that the shadow, and we're not going to put any negative connotation on the shadow, if the shadow represented blessings, if the shadow rep represented his gifts in your life, if the shadow represented his favor in your life, if the shadow represented, call it peace or hope or joy satisfaction, any of those kinds of things. There's just a real simplicity here that if in this context, if in this visual, the man pursues the shadow, he will eventually walk himself out of the light and never obtain the shadow. But if he walks towards the light, he will never ever cease to have a shadow. And this idea, the simplicity of if we walk towards the Lord, if I say I'm going to set my face and I'm going to set my life towards pursuing Christ in everything, not what he offers. If I have joy, fantastic, it's a gift. If he gives me peace, fantastic, it's a gift. If he gives me satisfaction, fantastic, it's a gift. If he blesses me with favor, beautiful, but even if I don't see those things at certain times in my life, I'm not pursuing the shadow anyway because I will never, ever be able to harness it. I'm going to regularly move towards him. I'm going to regularly move towards his word. I'm going to constantly pursue Jesus. And if I do, then the shadow will always be following me. Scripture says this in James chapter 1. Every good and perfect gift is from above. Coming down from the Father of heavenly lights who does not change like shifting shadows. And then Psalm 23 says this, Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So Jesus says, 
the pure in heart shall see God. If you start with the glory of God, the Shekinah glory of God, the fact that he wants to dwell, he wants to have his presence with you, and I'm going to anchor my life, not to the feelings that come and go, but I'm going to anchor my life to the facts of his presence, who he is, his word. I'm going to constantly, regularly move towards him and not towards the shadow behind me. We will continue to see him in our lives. Lives. And that brings me to 401, seeing God 401. And uh, this requires endurance of this pursuit of purity. And uh, that sounds pretty simple. Uh, but there was something that kind of surfaced for me uh, not too long ago about endurance. Um, and the reality, the reality for most of us, um, that if we're on a journey... Let's call it 10 miles, let's call it 10 years, let's call it whatever, but it's a journey. Uh, I've noticed that the latter is often harder than the beginning. Uh, I was was driving uh, not too long ago, I had a 12 plus hour drive, and uh, all by myself, and uh, just kind of pushing through, and uh, for me, the first 10 hours or so was pretty simple. Uh, You know, I was listening to music and podcasts and whatnot, and it was kind of clicking away. That last hour and a half was worse than the previous 10 hours. Have you ever had that happen where you're like, you just can't get there quick enough? When you start shutting down, you're shutting down. And um, the reality that the end often is much heavier and harder if, you, if you've been carrying somebody, you have a loved one, and you've been carrying them through something, and you carry them for a period of time, there's kind of an endurance you have, but you can hit a point that one week is harder than the five years that you carried them. Or you're at a job, and it's problematic, and this one month or this one season got much heavier than everything before it. Uh, it can get harder at the end, and, and I was thinking about this verse It is powerful if you take that concept and you take it into Paul's words in 2 Timothy where he says, the time has come for my departure. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. There was uh, something that happened. Uh, I know we might not have a number of people here that are into triathlons and triathletes and whatnot, Uh, but just this last weekend, there was a lady professional triathlete, former two-time Olympian that was in an Ironman, and um, she is literally winning the race. She has a seven-minute lead on second place. She is entering into the very last mile of the run. For those that don't know Ironman, 2.4-mile swim, 112-mile ride, and then a 26-mile run. I did an Ironman years ago. They're very difficult. She is in the last mile of her race, winning by seven minutes, and her body completely shuts down. She didn't even finish. She didn't even finish. She had to be carted off. And uh, sometimes the end is so much harder than everything that you've been carrying thus far. So it's fascinating to me that Paul would say, I finished. I carried it all the way to the end. I I fought the good fight. Um, For us, sometimes purity is easy in the beginning. It's easy to be pure in a marriage when you just got married. Fast forward 30 years, 40 years. Uh, Sometimes it's easy to be pure in employment on day one or week one of the job. Fast forward 10, 15, 20 years down the road. Uh, Sometimes it's easy to be pure in the beginning of a second chance, but spread that out over time. And I thought today, we might have somebody here that uh, purity for you has become increasingly difficult to carry, Um, where you've been uh, frustrated or exhausted or discouraged or disappointed 
And if possibly this describes you today, if you say, Joel, truth be told, I feel like my fingers are about to give on this thing. I'm trying. I'm trying to stay pure. I want to remind you a couple of things. I want to remind you, start with the glory of God, not who you are. Start with the fact that he says he's Emmanuel, God with us. His desire is to dwell with you and your body. You are a temple of the Holy Spirit. Connect your faith to the facts, not to the feelings of what you're going through. And I wanted to read to you some facts. Today, let me speak to your soul some facts. The scripture says this out of Romans chapter 8. What then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, pause right there. Where you see us, get a little personal. Make the scriptures personal. Put your name, identify it with you. If God is for me, if God is for you, who can be against us? Listen to me, that's fact. Maybe you're feeling overwhelmed with something today. You're like, I don't know. If God is for you, who can be against you? Fact. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How would he not also along with him graciously give us, you, me, all things? That's fact. Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies fact. Verse 34, who is he that condemns? Christ Jesus who died more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Listen to me right there. Don't race past that. That is fact, and you need to know that. Boy, if I could get one-on-one -on -one with you before we read any further, I would want you to know that the Spirit of God calls your name to the Father. Calls your name to the Father. He makes intercession for you. Some of you may have filled out a prayer card, and you'd like me and our staff to pray for you and by. By all means, we will. We're honored to be able to do that. What the scripture tells you, tells me, we have one far, far, far greater that intercedes for us. And it continues on. And it says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we, you, me, are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Fact. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor any else, anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And can you say amen to that? Now, let me pause for just a second. You know, when the scriptures were written, they weren't written with chapter and verse. That came much later in the breakout. So whatever follows is a continuous thought. Have you ever paid attention to the next statement Paul makes? The next statement Paul makes in chapter 9, verse 1, he says, I speak the truth in Christ, fact. I'm not lying conscience confirms it in the Holy Spirit I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart have you ever noticed that Paul's not writing because he just won the lottery and he's like who shall separate us from the love of Christ you know he is not coming from a place of over victory, 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 victory and if God is for us who can be against us, God is good all the time all the time God is good He's saying, I speak the truth, and the fact has got to come before my feelings. And I'm struggling. But I'm convinced that nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Listen, it is not about how good you are. It is not about whether you're clean enough that you get God's attention. And he says, <laughs> I like what I see. I'm going to draw near to you. It is simply the fact that he loves you and nothing can separate you from that love. And when we say, God, would you dwell with me? He takes you up on that. 
last thing that I'll say, and it's there in your notes, is the Lord wants you to see himself. He's not a God that is trying to play peekaboo. He's not a God that's trying to play hide and seek. He's not a God that's trying to hide off in the weeds so that you can't find him. He wants you to see himself. So anchor your life. And uh, more specifically, anchor this week to his presence. Anchor this week to dwelling with him, spending some time with him, saying, God, would you dwell with me? And um, if maybe feelings are getting a leg up on facts, then I'm going to come back to facts. Holy Spirit, would you help me come back to the facts of your scripture? If you have a prayer request that has been going unanswered and has you frustrated, feelings can mess with you. But come back to the facts of the scripture. Turn towards him if you've been turned towards his blessings. Turn towards him and pursue him. The shadow will always be following. And if maybe you've been carrying something for a long time now, He will renew. I would challenge and encourage you to take Romans chapter 8 and read it all week long and see it as fact because he renews us with his presence. This morning, I want to pray for you. And I want to pray that this week you will see God in your life. Father, we thank you for this time. And um, thank you for your word. Blessed are the pure in heart for they will see God. I pray, Father, for anyone in here. Uh that is saying, Lord, show yourself to me. Let your presence dwell with me. I pray, Father, that you'd reveal yourself in powerful ways, that they would start, that I would start, we would start this week with your glory. Lord, help us this week to not be measured by feelings, to not measure our faith according to what we feel, but according to what the facts of the scripture say about who you are. Lord, help us to keep our eyes on you and to pursue you. I pray lastly that you would renew your sons and daughters. If there's anyone in here that is weary, that things are slipping from their hands, they feel faith is slipping or they feel peace is slipping, they feel hope is slipping, they feel sound mind is slipping, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would renew them, that you would renew them and that they would be able to testify like Paul, I have finished my race. I have fought my fight that they were enduring to the end. Lord, would you bless your people today as we prepare to go. We love you in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Amen.